Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome back to my channel where I talk about my journey to sustainable health and meaningful success. If you're coming back and you've already subscribed, welcome back. Y'all are my people and I love you so, so much. And if you're new, I hope you'll consider subscribing by the end of this video. I post about anti-MLM stuff on Wednesdays and I talk about my health journey on Sundays. And uh, today we are talking about Midsummer and how it relates to multi-level marketing. So if you're new to MLM or anti-MLM content, I suggest that you learn about it before you watch this video because this video is pretty intense and yeah. So I'm sorry that this format is going to be weird. I have tried to film this video like five separate times, but copyright is a pain. And so I'm not going to be using any video clips or audio clips or screenshots from the movie Midsommar. So if you haven't already seen Midsommar and you would like to before I talk about the movie, then I would suggest that you go on Amazon Prime or go on YouTube and watch the movie before we talk about this because it might get a little bit messy and I'm sorry, but oh my God, I have put in so much effort <laughs> toward this video. So that is that. If I sound like I'm talking with a different energy today, it is because I'm at the end of my mental health rope with this video. Um, <laughs> the movie Midsommar is a horror movie, so trigger warning if you are sensitive to topics of death, suicide, any other cult-like kind of horror film genre kind of topics, then I suggest that you get to know me in a different video, okay? <laughs> let's, not, let's not push it with this one. And if I ever sound like I'm making light of a topic that is within this video, I hope that um, you know my heart in that I'm not trying to make light of the subject. It's just that I have been focusing on this for like the past several days. And so for my own sake, I kind of have to keep it a little bit chipper, <laughs> even though I am really bummed out. Okay. <laughs> um, so yes, there will be spoilers. So if you're going to get mad at me, go watch the video beforehand, watch the movie beforehand. And if you uh, have just recently gotten out of a multi-level marketing company or a cult or um, an extremely manipulative and controlling environment, then I'm going to link this seminar that's happening on Saturday. It's an online seminar. Um, I'm going to link that information in my description just so that you have that as a resource. It's $37 for a ticket. I'm not sponsored by them. I'm just kind of giving this and making this available to you. Um, but it's going to be a three hour seminar led by a licensed therapist talking about how to recover from a highly controlling environment. So if that is something that's helpful for you, I wanted to just kind of give you that resource. And if there's any thing that I talk about in this video that I need to explain more or need to do a whole separate video on, please let me know in the comments because I want to keep the dialogue going and yeah, I want to give you the best content possible. So that is all that I have to say. Let's get into it. Before the movie even starts though, <laughs> like five seconds into the film, it opens up to a tapestry where literally if you were to pause the movie and look at the images, you could figure out the entire plot of the movie just within that first opening frame of the film. This is something that is actually throughout the whole movie. You see images, tapestries, wall paintings of different elements of the movie that is like the writing on the wall before the scene happens. And I find this fascinating as it relates to multi-level marketing because the writing on the wall with multi-level marketing is there before you even go to an information session. Uh, you might be looking at the writing on the wall right now. If you're doing your research on a multi-level marketing company or you've been watching my videos for a while to see what my experience is, it's like the tapestries. You are looking at it without even having to experience it. You know what's going to happen. You can do your research on multi-level multi marketing and find the statistics that show that the majority of people fail and that only a very, very small minority actually succeed and actually make money. But the rest of the people either don't make money or they lose money in a multi-level marketing company. So for that reason, it is important to even notice in Midsommar that the writing is on the wall before we even start the film. 
So as we open up into the film, we get to know Danny. Danny is our girl. She is the main character and she is in a relationship with this guy named Christian. Christian is a little bit apathetic towards everything. He's not really into his school. He's not really into the relationship. He's just kind of like lost and directionless. And Danny at the beginning of the film goes through this terrible, terrible tragedy. Her sister commits suicide and also murders both of her parents. So Danny loses her entire family within the first like three minutes of the film. This is setting the stage for the two of them to enter into this environment. Uh, but isn't that kind of how most people are recruited into multi-level marketing? I mean, either they're apathetic and kind of directionless and bored with life or not wanting to live the same day over and over and over again, not wanting to be held by their nine to five job, wanting to find some deeper ambition, some greater purpose, and they're just kind of stuck in a rut, kind of like Christian. Or you could be on the flip side and you could have just come through something really tragic, um, been dealing with something really major. Um, an example of that is like when I left college, I was in the worst mental health state of my life up to that point. And I was really directionless. So I was kind of a mix of both Christian and Danny that I was directionless, apathetic toward the job that I currently had. But also I was going through some deep like grief and mental health issues. And, you know, we see this within this past year. There's a lot of people who are just kind of desperate, desperate for hope, desperate to process emotions and desperate for community, um, especially with the pandemic and everything. So you so we start the movie seeing that they're both at a kind of vulnerable and unexciting Place. And that's where a lot of people actually end up getting recruited into multi-level marketing is because they're in a similar situation. They're either um, really apathetic and really disenchanted with life, or they are desperate for hope and desperate for some peace. It's at this point that we meet Pele, the friend who is inviting them to go with them to his home in Sweden to a festival. It's like a nine day festival. Um, it's going to be full of pageantry and you might think that some of our practices are a little bit silly, but it's something that, you know, we just like to do in celebration. And this is the information that he gives them in inviting them to Sweden. So he invites Danny, Christian, and their couple of friends along for this festival in Sweden. And I find this scene really interesting because he doesn't give any of the sinister details. He certainly doesn't give any details of what they're actually there to do, but he gives all of the fluffy details. He gives all of the, you know, lighthearted, like, oh, look at, this is um, our May Queen and this is a celebration and they're all dressed in white and it's beautiful. And I think that that's interesting with regards to multi-level marketing because we just recently covered this in uh, one of my last videos about how they don't actually give the details that would be necessary to make an informed decision, but they give details of financial independence and look at my mentor and look at how successful he is and look at his family and he's able to quit his job and all of these light fluffy details without actually getting into the details of what they're actually there for or what the company actually does or even what the company is named. In Amway's case, they even hide those details. So very similar to how Pele, the recruiter, brings his friends into Sweden into this festival, so too does multi-level marketing recruit people without actually giving them the full information until they're actually like deeper into the process. So they transition and they're already in Sweden. They're on their way to the camp, but they pull over to meet some new recruits, some other recruits from a different person who, you know, brought a couple of his friends along and they all meet up and then <laughs> decide to take mushrooms and just get really high and trip on shrooms. That's basically what it is. And there's a lot of mind altering substances throughout the entire movie. 
and they start that immediately as soon as they get into into Sweden and before they even get to the camp they're taking mind altering substances on top of that in Sweden it's like the summer solstice it's the eternal sunlight the sun doesn't really go down ever um, at this point in the year and so it's incredibly disorienting because it might be right outside but it's 9 p.m. and so there's this element of mind-altering substances and sleep deprivation and disorientation that they are battling with before they even make it into the camp and I find this interesting with regards to multi-level marketing because it's the exact same thing number one they have you working with a work ethic of if you're sleeping you're doing something wrong so oftentimes you're reading sending messages you know doing all of your contacting working trying to balance some sort of family life but you're doing all of the steps necessary to succeed in the company but you're doing that until two or three in the morning they keep you at um, night owls or these like late night meetings until really late at night on a weekday knowing that you have to get up early the next day for work um, there's no uh, there's no concept of actual like safe driving or you know taking care of your body and getting enough rest rest is for when you're retired rest is for when you've succeeded and for now you just have to sacrifice sleep and sacrifice that comfort in order to succeed in the multi-level marketing company well sleep deprivation is one of the biggest tactics that you can use to manipulate someone control someone it's what they use in interrogation tactics sleep deprivation is a huge mind control uh, tool on top of that they're mind altering substances now in the movie midsummer we see that with a lot of mushrooms and a lot of drugs um, but in multi-level marketing it could be the environment it could be the audios that they have you listening to constantly in between meetings you're having meeting meetings once or twice a week you're talking to your upline you're going to conferences you're reading books your mind is supposed to be constantly on this positivity high and you're never supposed to be um, letting yourself get too negative or get too swept up into you know mediocrity or anything so you're supposed to constantly be diluting the negative with these you know audio tapes and the conferences in fact the conferences are once every quarter but once you go to a conference off of the high and the energy boost that you get from being at a conference being sleep deprived for an entire weekend listening to hours and hours of them download this information to brainwash you throughout their conferences then within the next week the sales for the tickets of the next conference go up so that you can purchase your conference ticket for the next conference while you're still high on the last conference that just happened and so by the time the conference rolls around and you're tired and you're kind of apathetic you already have your ticket purchased and you can continue to be in that loop and in the bubble of you know the Amway or the MLM mentality and so in this way we see the cult-like and manipulation tactics of Midsommar with the drugs and with the sleep deprivation and just how generally disorienting it is and that's exactly what multi-level marketing does in order to keep people in and keep people engaged in the community and in the environment when Danny Christian and their friends arrive at the camp the first thing that you notice is that it is such broad daylight and everybody is wearing white there's very hypnotic cheerful kind of peppy music playing in the background and everyone is welcoming them with smiles and hugs and let me take your bag and it's a very welcoming warm environment I love this imagery first of all because it's the first horror movie that I've ever heard of that actually plays out all of these horrors in broad daylight in fact like most horror kind of relies on the darkness on the unknown but what this movie does is it takes the most sunny the most warm environment and it's it's happening in front of your eyes and it's supposed to be this festival it's supposed to be celebratory and literally it is 
a horrific, horrific time for nine days. Um, so they're, so they're greeted by these people dressed all in white, and that's a symbol of purity. It's a symbol of innocence. And I love that because <laughs> that's exactly how multi-level marketing recruiters are. I mean, aren't these MLM environments just the most cheerful, most positive, most innocent and, you know, go-getter and just, this is just such a empowering environment and, um, you know, a lot of your upline kind of comes across as being super pure and super blameless. Um, and they make themselves out to be really morally on the high ground. And that's exactly what it is in Midsommar. You enter with this visual imagery of nothing being a threat. And that's exactly what happens in multi-level marketing companies. You're instantly greeted with positivity and you never really see anybody be negative. And little do you know that they're not allowed to be negative. They're not allowed to be real about their lives. So all you see is everybody being happy. It's such a sunny and warm environment. And it's you can't help but feel welcomed. My favorite scene of the movie is when they are going on the tour. So all of these newcomers, Danny, Christian, their friends, and then the new recruits, they're all being given this tour of the camp. That they're in and the first question that pops into Christian's mind is to look over at a building that isn't being used and funnily enough it looks like a pyramid but um, there's this you know pyramid shaped building far off in the distance and he asks what is this building for and the recruiter responds saying it's a sacred temple but it's not, we're not allowed to go in, to, in there, you know, it's, it's very off limits. And that's all that's said about it. And then within the next few seconds, they walk past a bear in a cage. And this is in the middle of a field. And there's just a bear in the cage, just there. And one of the guys asks, so we're just going to ignore the bear there? <laughs> AKA, like, why the heck is there a bear there? And the recruiter simply responds, it's a bear. And then finally, they walk past this clothesline where there's a brand new, like freshly painted tapestry or freshly woven tapestry um, that plays out a few pictures of something that's about to happen in the movie. And they look at it and they are interested in, in what the tapestry means. And the recruiter says, it's a love story. This scene is so perfectly describing of the red flags that you see throughout the movie. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what they use the temple for, exactly what they use the bear for, or what the tapestry means. But if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what it means. And um, I think that that's something that's very interesting with regards to multi-level marketing because there are certain things that you ask information about and they'll give you some information about like, you know, it's a, it's a temple, but we're not allowed to go in there. And that's something that if you were to ask a multi-level marketing recruiter, you know, well, what's your company or what do you do? They might say something along the lines of I'm in marketing or, um, I help people grow their businesses or I'm currently in a program and being mentored to own my own business and I hope to retire someday. But they won't actually tell you how and they won't give you the full details of what actually that entails. Another example would be the bear. So we're just going to ignore the bear there. It's a bear. I talked about this in a video at like two videos ago where they did their contacting audio in Amway. Um, there were certain red flags that were arising. Like you might think that what we're doing is manipulative or, or playing mind games, but let me go off on this tangent that absolutely does not answer the question at all, but make you think that your question is answered. And that's exactly what happens in this scene where he says, so we're just going to ignore the bear there. It's a bear. Well, that wasn't the question. The question is, why is there a bear in a cage in the middle of a field? But the question was addressed, but not answered. And they just kind of let it go. And finally, 
when it comes to the tapestry, they ask about what is this? What is this tapestry? And the recruiter responds, it's a love story, which I'm not going to go into the details of that because that's a plot line that I don't particularly want to discuss in this video. But basically the plot line of this tapestry is not a love story. It's just not. <laughs> that is romanticizing it to the highest degree if you think that that plot line is a love story. So that's why this scene is so key. It's because they're just now getting acquainted with the environment. They're just now getting acquainted with the camp and they're starting to see some red flags. And even though their questions aren't te technically answered and they're not technically being given all of the details, they're being pacified with just enough information to make them think that they are not supposed to be detecting any danger. The first red flag that Danny and Christian actually recognize is trigger warning, but is when they have a feast for these two elderly adults um, who then go to the top of a cliff and everybody else goes to the bottom of the cliff and the two elderly people jump off the cliff and plummet to their death in sacrificial suicide. I would say that's a pretty big red flag. <laughs> um, and clearly, you know, they are freaked out by this. This is a very graphic scene in the movie and there was no warning whatsoever that this was what was going to happen in the movie. And this is the first thing that is actually like, holy crap, uh, we are not where we thought we were going. And I think that this is symbolic of some of the bigger red flags in multi-level marketing that if we look back on our time, we could have easily detected that this is abnormal. But at the time, you know, there were different ways to deal with it, which we'll talk about in a minute. But some of the red flags that I can think about in my multi-level marketing experience is like when I was about to exchange phone numbers with one of my crossline friends and my upline intercepted that interaction and said, no, actually we don't, um, we don't exchange contact information with crossline because we want to keep the, the lines pure. We want to keep, um, you know, business lines very structured and gave this whole reason for why, you know, associating with people outside of business meetings would possibly jeopardize the income and um, possibly mess up business relationships if you were to take things a little bit more personal and outside of the business um, environment. And that's why you're not allowed to exchange contact information with anyone. But even though my upline kind of reasoned it out, it's very blatant that this woman just told me, a grown woman, that I cannot exchange phone numbers with another grown woman. And that is to an outsider, and sim similarly to like Danny and Christian in the story of Midsommar, these kind of events are jarring. They are completely abnormal. There's no way that that would be acceptable. But for some reason, within the environment, it's accepted. Another big red flag that I could have caught on a lot earlier, and this is similar to like the writing on the wall, is that when I first, my very first meeting in Amway, I met several people who had been in the business for several years and only had one downline or didn't have any downline and wasn't actually making money in the business. And that should have been a huge red flag that I was entering into an environment where there's only one person who is retired from their job, but there's a hundred people who've been in for a long time and they're not making money. And that should have been a huge red flag. But there were reasons why I overlooked even the biggest red flag. And that is exactly how that is received in the movie Midsommar. Even the two people who just plummeted to their death and sacrifice themselves by suicide. Such a jarring scene. And there were still ways to rationalize it. And that's exactly how uh, that's reacted to. So Christian, on one hand, is trying to rationalize it. Like, this is a cultural thing. I mean, I know that was really shocking, but, you know, 
they would be shocked to find that we put our elderly in nursing homes. So, you know, we just have to acclimate. So he's trying to rationalize it and trying to come up with some justifiable reason as to why two people just committed suicide. And that is the best that he could come up with. But he doesn't want to see the truth. He doesn't want to see that this is a really dangerous situation. So that's how he rationalizes it. The second scenario is Danny. Danny is freaked out. She wants to leave. She starts packing up. But the recruiter, Pele, comes in and intercepts her and starts calming her down. And instead of actually addressing what just happened in this double suicide scene, he starts talking about feel felt found with her, her the loss of her parents, the you know tragedy that she's been grieving throughout this whole movie, and says, exact, I know exactly how you feel. You know, I know how you must be feeling. I felt the same way. I lost my parents. And what I found is that this is a beautiful community and this is a family and this is where you can feel safe and held. And so he is addressing her panic with the shocking thing that she just saw by distracting her and talking about something completely different and building rapport with feel felt found I know exactly how you feel. I felt the same way. What I found was yada, yada, yada. And then on top of that, in this conversation, he then goes and says, I, I'm, I want to ask you about Christian. Do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? And basically calling in question her current, you know, support system, her boyfriend, and driving a wedge in between her and Christian by kind of flirting with her, bringing her into this emotionally intimate moment, and then asking her, you know, does he feel like home to you? So in this one very simple scene, Pele, the recruiter, has now just taken Danny from complete panic and shock from something horrific that she just witnessed, a huge red flag that she is in danger, and turns the conversation completely into feel felt found about her current vulnerability and also let's try to drive some separation in between you and the person from the outside that you would be connected to and support. This is something that with multi-level marketing, so multi-level marketing, anybody can rationalize any red flags away. They can come up with any sort of excuse or just distraction from the actual truth of a multi-level marketing company. So anybody could be like Christian. A lot of un us unfortunate people have been like Danny in the fact that we can see red flags, but as soon as we detect something dangerous, there's something else that is love bombing us. There's something else that's drawing us emotionally into the need for this multi-level marketing or the need for the hope of success, or the need for community, or anything like that. And so what he did, what Pele the recruiter did to Danny in this scene, is play off of her vulnerability and really, um, you know, hit hard into what she was truly feeling. And then on top of that, further separated her from anyone from the outside and isolated her into this little bubble of this community that this is the only place that she could feel safe. And it's a very they us versus them mentality. And that's what a lot of cults do. And that's exactly what he did in order to distract her from the jarring scene that she had just witnessed. Finally, we look at a couple of other um, of the outsiders who just witnessed this jarring scene. Connie and Simon, and these were other recruits from a different person, and they're freaked out, and there is no way that you could rationalize with them. There's no way that you could comfort them. They know what they just witnessed was messed up, and they need to get out of there, and that is when you start to see that the elders of the group start explaining away the disappearances of the people who have a dissenting opinion or the people who are catching on that they're in a very dangerous situation. And so the elders are explaining to them, oh, Simon had to leave on an earlier truck uh, because we, 
you know, there's only, the bus leaves in 90 minutes and we have to make two separate trips that we can only fit one passenger at a time. And so even though Connie and Simon came together, they have to leave separately. And so we'll come back for you, Connie, but we had to take Simon separately, which is very uncharacteristic of Connie and Simon because they're in love and, you know, they came on this trip together. So for an elder to be explaining as to why Simon isn't there, it's just odd. And so we start seeing the elders explaining away the disappearances of some of the outsiders. Well, spoiler alert, they all die. But this is something that is very common in multi-level marketing, that as soon as there's a dissenting opinion, they start to kind of sequester the dissenting opinion from the rest of the people whose minds are perfectly brainwashed, who are perfectly indoctrinated. And so even if someone hasn't quit yet, but they're starting to voice some doubts and they're starting to be a little bit negative about the business opportunity, they will start to kind of sequester them. Um, they won't be putting them in cars. They, they won't be arranging the car pool situation so that they are with newcomers. They'll definitely make sure that they're with someone who's experienced and who has a better mindset, or they won't put the dissenting opinion with someone, uh, like in a hotel with someone for the conferences. Um, someone who is like new and impressionable, they'll definitely try to make sure that the negativity is contained within just, you know, the person and possibly a couple other people who are experienced in the business environment and who have, you know, a higher tolerance to someone having a different opinion and who aren't as vulnerable to someone questioning business practices. And then, as soon as you decide to leave, they make you leave and they make sure that you disappear without a trace. And because you're not allowed to exchange contact information with Crossline, the only people who know the, the actual circumstance of your leaving is your upline. And so I saw this multiple times. And um, in fact, this Friday on Instagram, I'm going live with um, Jackie is her name and I will link her Instagram information and the information of this below because on Friday we get to reconnect. We haven't seen each other in years. She left Amway before I left and because we were cross line, we didn't have each other's contact information. So it's taken me a long time and I kind of did some research a little bit and found out that she changed her last name because she just recently got married. And so finally, after years, we are able to reconnect and we're going to do that on Instagram live and talk about our Amway experience together Friday night, 7 p.m. Central Time. And uh, but when Jackie left my upline, when I asked them, where's Jackie? Um, they just said that she just she just quit. She just ghosted them without a trace, which was very uncharacteristic of Jackie. And turns out Jackie left for very good reasons, told them exactly what the reasons were. But when she left, they decided that they would cover up any reason for why she left and just make her disappear without a trace. And that's exactly what we see in Midsummer. As soon as someone kind of gets hip to reality and realizes that they're in a very dangerous situation, they're gone, they disappear. At this point, I also want to just point out this little conversation that Christian has with one of the elders where he asks, hey, you guys are a small community. How do you guys avoid incest? And um, the elder responds saying like, well, we do respect the incestual traditions or whatever and talks about their weird sexual ta taboo. But then the elder says, but the elders must approve the mates. And I think that that is really creepily accurate to my experience in an MLM because within my MLM, we were not allowed to date anybody cross line. And if we were dating someone upline, regardless of who we were dating, we had to let our upline know, or we had to have permission from our upline to date them. So for instance, I spent four hours in a car with the same guy for like 
a year and a half because we both lived in Wisconsin and he would give me rides down to Chicago because I was broke as a joke. And so we would spend so many hours in a car together and I'll admit it, <laughs> I fell for him and I fell for him hard. And I don't know if he had, you know, feelings for me, but instead of me just asking him directly like a normal person, I went to my upline who went to her upline who went to her husband to find out if this guy had any feelings for anyone in particular and because her husband didn't think so then that was the information that traveled back to me and that was the end of the matter and had he had feelings for me he would have had to go to his upline to ask permission to date me because we were cross line and this is just something that is like it's actually very accurate that even within MLMs, like uh, within my group at least, the elders must approve the mates. And how cult-like is that? Even though, even when I was dating somebody who was outside of the business, when I told my upline that I had broken up with him, uh, she's like, why is this, why is this news to me? Like, I'm your mentor. I should know this about you. Like, this should not come as a surprise to me. I should already know this. So there is an extreme amount of control within, you know, dating and everything, even if you're dating someone who's not in the business. The isolation and love bombing continues with Danny and Christian as their friends one by one disappear and they are the only two outsiders left. On one hand, we have Danny who is put into this dance competition with all the other women in the community and they have to like dance until the last one standing and the last one standing is crowned the May Queen. And I love the line that the hostess of this dance competition um, says at the, at the beginning, she says, um, once they began, they could not stop and they danced themselves to death. I find this interesting just because, you know, when you start with an MLM and you start trying to build multi-level marketing as a, you know, a success venture, <laughs> once they began, they could not stop and they danced themselves to death. That is a little bit telling. Um, but yeah, Danny wins the dance competition and she is crowned the May Queen. She's celebrated as the queen of the celebration and she's put at the highest honor of the you know dining table she's asked to bless the earth and the crops and all these different things so she's highly celebrated meanwhile Christian has been uh, pulled off to the side and said hey um, we just had this virgin approved to have sex and we'd like you to have sex with her so you can get her pregnant and so that's what happens in a very weird and bizarre scene that I will not go into further detail about and so both of them are, you know, pulled off into separate directions, um, love bombed, isolated, all of this. Well, at this point, Danny, um, in a roundabout way, she actually like sees Christian having sex with this virgin. And so she is like mortified. Obviously, that's her boyfriend cheating on her in a very bizarre way. And, um, so she runs off to go cry and throughout this whole movie, every time Danny goes off to cry, goes off to grieve, you know, she's dealing with clearly since the beginning of the movie, she's been dealing with intense grief. And so every time she goes off to cry, she cries alone and she makes sure that she's in an isolated, secluded place so that she can just cry and deal with her feelings. And it just kind of proves further the point of isolation and the point of like, just how alone she was in everything that she was experiencing. But then Midsummer coming in with the creep factor, all of the ladies in waiting from the dance competition follow her into this area that she goes to cry in. And they are like literally face to face crying in unison with her. It's the most bizarre. It's one of the most bizarre scenes of the movie. Like, there's so many bizarre scenes in this movie, but it, this is one of them. And 
I don't want to say that there's a parallel exactly to multi-level marketing because you'll never see a group of women just like crying in unison. <laughs> if you do, <laughs> you need to run. <laughs> you need to run real, real fast and real hard. Um, but I think that this was symbolic of the fact that she was no longer alone. And I think that that's so, that's such a painful concept, honestly, to realize that like in this scenario, she's in such a dangerous situation. She's in such, such a dangerous situation. Um, all of her friends have been brutally, brutally killed. And, uh, and all she is surrounded with is community. And she, all of her, you know, needs are being met that hadn't been met before in the most bizarre way. And maybe I'm misreading this scene completely. If, if I am, let me know in the comments, please. Um, let me know your analysis because I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. But as they're crying in unison, there's like an oddly like odd sense of relief or release or just comfort even. I don't know. I'm not comforted by the scene, but just the thought that she's no longer crying alone is an interesting development in how she perceives this group. The last few minutes of the movie, everything comes together and we start seeing these red flags that we had kind of pushed off into the back corner of our minds come forward. Danny being crowned the May Queen is given the authority to elect the ninth human sacrifice for their festival. And of course, after seeing Christian with the Virgin, um, she elects him to be the ninth human sacrifice. And suddenly we start seeing all of the corpses of the other outsiders being wheelbarrowed into the secret temple that we couldn't talk about before. And now we know exactly what this temple is for. The temple is for human sacrifice. So, uh, yeah, Christian is paralyzed. He's, um, fully awake and conscious of what's going on, but, um, yeah, they take that bear. Remember the, the bear that we were just going to ignore? Well, they take it and they gut it and then stuff Christian into the bear. And then we set Christian up in the bear in the secret temple that nobody was able to talk about. And why they put Christian in the bear? It's a bear. And of course, what is human sacrifice without a little fire? And so that's exactly what they do. They burn the entire pyramid looking temple to the ground with Christian alive in it couple other people alive in it and the corpses of all of their dead friends in it. Um, this is a weird, bizarre scene. It's a lot to take in and Danny being the only survivor left from the outside group being crowned the May Queen is like overwhelmed with sadness at the beginning of this burning sacrifice, but slowly as the scene progresses and as we get closer to the end of the movie, she starts calming down and she just starts kind of gazing upon the pyramid. And within the last frame of the movie, her face turns into a smile. Super eerie super weird, like what the hell, all of your friends have just been made into human sacrifices to whatever God they are sacrificing to and you're smiling. This leaves us with a lot of conflicting emotions because, and a lot of questions, because number one, my question is what's going to happen to Danny? Has she yet to meet her fate? Is she the next human sacrifice? Or is she safe? And number two, is she smiling because she has some sort sense of like victory? And some people have even commented on Midsummer being like the best breakup movie ever because they think that this is a breakup movie between Danny and Christian. 
and the fact that Christian is being sacrificed alive in a bear that was just gutted, um, that's, that's supposed to be some sort of triumphant breakup and freedom from, for, for Danny. I don't know what Midsummer was trying to come across with this, but I do know that by the end of the movie, with two and a half hours of this repetitive, like, hypnotic music playing in your ears and, like, all of the weird stuff that happens, there's a good portion of the audience that actually ends up feeling satisfied and leaving the movie with a smile on their face, feeling like, oh, good for Danny. And that's exactly the purpose of the movie Midsummer. I mean, their goal was to make it so that even though there were huge red flags, even though there were huge jarring scenes of like terrible, terrible stuff, like truly, truly disturbing. And if you're leaving the movie theater with a smile on your face, then that is exactly the kind of brainwashing that Midsommar set to prove that they could do. I think that that is why Danny's smile is so sinister and eerie is because it's supposed to make you feel like she won. And how this, res how this relates to multi-level marketing is in the exact same way. We don't know if Danny is the next person to fail at her MLM. I mean, there were like nine people sacrificed and she's the only person left who's survived other than, you know, the rest of the villagers. But she's, she's the only person from her group to actually survive. And so it leaves me with the question of, is she the next person to fail or is she supposed to be, um, is she supposed to be, you know, the, the diamond? Is she supposed to be the person who succeeded in her multi-level marketing company? So with multi-level marketing, you don't know if you're just in this eternal loop, if you're fully indoctrinated, fully brainwashed, and there's no red flag that could actually break your bubble of, you know, positivity and, you know, whatever the mentality they have indoctrinated you with that you're just, you're fully in it now. You're immersed, you're the May Queen, they're celebrating you, they're love bombing you, there's nothing that's gonna convince you that you're in a dangerous environment or that you stand to lose a lot. And obviously with multi-level marketing, you don't stand to lose your life, but you stand to lose a lot of time, money, you know, time with your family and your friends and jobs and other opportunities, school, you know, there's, Basically everything that makes up life, you stand to lose with investing everything that you have and all of your resources in a multi-level marketing company. And so when we see that Danny is the person who is left standing at the end of the movie, we wonder if she's just the next person in line to be sacrificed or if she's the person who, you know, gets to survive. And she did technically win in this scenario with multi-level marketing it's like okay you won like you may have made all of your money or you might be financially independent you might actually have been the top few percent who succeed the top minority who isn't sacrificed in the pyramid temple but does that make your victory justified and how delusional or how truly uh, unempathetic or completely void of emotion do you have to be in order to see that there are plenty of people who are losing in this opportunity and yet you on look to you you look on to their destruction and you think well at least I'm safe well at least I'm not in that pyramid burning and I think that that is the beautiful symbolism that Midsummer actually does serve to demonstrate and illustrate um, exactly what happens with multi-level marketing and with cults in general. You know, you'd, you might be not given the information right off the bat and by the time you're actually in the camp, you're kind of swept off your feet with all of these romantic grand gestures of warmth and sunshine and you know, purity and light and positivity. 
and you may brush aside some of the you know minor red flags and the little warning signs that kind of creep up and questions that you have in your mind that aren't quite answered but answered sufficiently enough that you could possibly rationalize it and then when you see large failures when you see large red flags that oh wow there's a very good possibility that I am spinning my wheels in this and that I stand to lose a lot more than I stand to gain but even still you might still justify it or you might try to leave and they might just love bomb you and try to hold you back right into the bosom of the the loving community or you may end up leaving and you may end up actually trying to get out and at that point all of that community that you built up will shut you out and make you disappear and you may lose contact with the people you were in business with simply by not them not wanting to associate with someone who would have a dissenting opinion and finally to the people who stay in multi-level marketing for however long until they either get hip to reality and leave or they just stay in hoping for years and years of accomplishing this American dream that's never actually going to happen you wonder how many people's lives and relationships and time with people who are valuable to them that they're that they're losing what is actually the sacrifice that is required for success of the minor few I'd love to hear your thoughts on the video Midsummer and if I left out any details or analysis that you would like to add please add that in the comments below again Friday night 7 p.m. Central I'm going live on Instagram with my friend Jackie I'm leaving her Instagram information below because it'll be on her account and we're gonna be reconnecting and talking about our time in Amway and then Saturday if you want to check out that post cult post manipulative environment kind of seminar uh, that'll be going on on Saturday next Wednesday I'm gonna probably talk a little bit more about the bite model with regards to MLM and cults and um, as always Sunday I'm talking about my health journey and uh, we'll be having a good time over there too so I love you guys so much thank you so much for watching and I hope that this video finds you well okay